think we can start now. It's seven. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, uh, um, uh, we're really deli delighted on behalf of Forum Australia to welcome um, uh, uh, everyone to this uh, webinar on climate change and Green New Deal with a very distinguished panel, uh, which includes John Hewson, former liberal leader of the opposition and professor at Crawford School at the Australian National University. We have Will Steffen, Professor Will Steffen. He is a founding director of ANU Climate Change Institute and a climate counselor now. Uh, we have Arna, Dr. Arna Greta Hunter. She is um, a senior lecturer at the Australian National University and a very uh, prominent environmentalist. And we have uh, Minister Shane Rattenbury, a Minister for Climate Change and Sustainability. Welcome everyone. Uh, this is our, um, our first webinar event in view of the COVID-19 situation and the second uh, forum um, that we've held this year. Originally, this was designed as a dinner event, but due to uh, the COVID situation, we have shifted to a webinar format. Uh, now, COVID-19, um, I hope everyone is safe under the situation and is keeping safe distance. Um, it is a pandemic that we are all experiencing and we hope we will be able to uh, resolve that uh, in, the, in the next couple of months and, and, uh, um, and have, have our health crisis um, really avoided uh, and people um, are safe. But there are many existential challenges uh, that we face and climate change is predominantly a very high on the list. Now, uh, the purpose of this seminar is really to look at how we can address climate action in view of the current challenges and how we can address them together. Australia <clears throat> is a country with conditions of both developed and developing countries. It is very uh, resourceful, but it, it is also heavily impacted by climate change. We have experienced um, the worst bushfires this season, um, this summer season. We, we have droughts and we have floods and the, these are all massive uh, extreme weather events that we face on a regular basis. And, and warnings have been um, uh, given by scientists in the past. It is nothing surprising in that context, but the policy response has been very uh, weak in that sense. Um, we are, what I would say, in an age of Anthropocene, in an age of adaptation, and we are dealing with a climate emergency and climate crisis. Are we in a position to leave this existential challenge and focus simply on other challenges or take an integrated view? Uh, COVID-19 provides another opportunity to address challenges together in an integrated manner. Uh, many uh, st uh, stimulus measures have been announced by various governments, including in Australia, where over $130 billion to stimulate the economy have, has been announced. So how can, how can we use this crisis to stimulate a more resilient pathway for planet and humanity? Uh, in the past, various measures like uh, public investment uh, in, uh, under the New Deal and um, in the previous recession in 2008, um, there were calls by uh, different organizations, including the United Nations, for a 2% of uh, GDP dedication to a Green New Deal concept um, uh, and stimulus measures in that uh, time. So, uh, I'm not going to go over that history, but many uh, uh, green investment pathways were taken at that time, including in Australia. So we're now in a situation, can we, can we use this opportunity to have a, a Green New Deal pathway for, for Australia? Um, I think I, um, uh, the, the, the panel would uh, look at some of these uh, questions um, and also address some of the questions that come from the, um, uh, uh, from the participants. So we will run the first half of the session um, uh, with uh, inputs from the, from the panelists. So without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Will Stefan to give us the scientific context uh, given um, that we are in a state of climate emergency and climate crisis. Over to you, Will. Thanks very much, uh, Imran, and thanks for the opportunity to talk tonight. Um, what I'd like to do, as Imran said, is give you the scientific background. 
uh, of why we are in a climate emergency, what does that look like, and really give you a sense of the enormity of the challenge we face. I'm going to use as a reference point for this the Paris uh, Climate Agreement, which nearly every country in the world, including Australia, has signed up to, and we'll look at that uh, temperature target range. So the Paris Agreement was to uh, hold temperature rise to well below two degrees, but to aim for 1.5. To put that into context, uh, the World Meteorological Organization just released last week the 2019 temperature uh, estimate, and that's 1.1 degrees uh, above uh, pre-industrial. So we're already uh, pushing toward that lower Paris target. In fact, I would say that the lower Paris target now is virtually impossible uh, given past emissions and where we sit today. The way I like to look at these questions about what is feasible, what is possible, and so on, is to use something called the carbon uh, budget approach. And that's uh, very similar to budgets that you would be used to. Uh, it'd be similar to a financial budget if you have a certain amount of uh, money that you can spend on a project or on your family budget or whatever. Uh, you can spend only that much and no more unless you're going to go into debt. Uh, same thing with a carbon budget. If you want a certain temperature target, uh, you can only spend, that is, emit so much carbon uh, before you uh, uh, transgress that, that target. So let's look, for example, at the Paris 1.5, the lower target. Where do we sit today? We take a 66 probability, percent probability of meeting that target. Obviously, a lot of us think that's too low, um, but even you'll see how daunting it is uh, to meet the target with uh, two-thirds probability. So I'll give you two scenarios. One is what I call the realistic scenario, and the second one, which I call the optimistic scenario. The realistic scenario is this, uh, that we look at our budget that's left, and we have to reduce it uh, by a small amount, but still significant, because there are other gases other than carbon dioxide, like methane and nitrous oxide. And they are harder to get out of the economy than carbon dioxide. So the budget assume that we will reduce those emissions at the same rate as we reduce CO2. That's very hard to do. So you have to allow a little bit uh, higher reduction of CO2. The second point is that there are so-called feedbacks in the climate system. That is, nature itself, as it heats up, releases carbon to the atmosphere. Melting permafrost is a good example. Uh, dying forests, like in the Amazon, uh, large wildfires, such as in Australia, emit carbon back to the atmosphere. So you must allow for that. All right, so what's the bottom line? When you look at the budget we have left, uh, and I'm using the IPCC budget here, we really have to hit net zero by 2026 or 2027 uh, to meet the 1.5 target. Uh, clearly that's not possible. Uh, that means totally decarbonize every country in the world uh, in six or seven years. So you can pretty much rule out the, what I call the realistic budget. So what if we then go to what some people call the optimistic budget? And that is, let's be optimistic and say we somehow find a way to get methane and nitrous oxide uh, uh, under control as fast as we reduce CO2. And remember, we have to reduce CO2 at a minimum of 7 or 8% per year, which is more than COVID-19 is reducing it. So this is a really big ask. But let's say we can do it. And we can do the other gases as well. Uh, and let's say that we've overestimated how much nature is going to pump back in. And let's cut that in half, or even a bit more than half, down from about 70 billion tons to about 30 billion to carbon, uh, which is only permafrost. So when you look at that optimistic scenario, you can stretch the budget out to about 2035, or maybe a few years beyond that. But still, that is an enormous ask uh, to get uh, uh, economies totally decarbonized, but maybe not totally impossible. When you look at the upper Paris target, which would be, you might say, 1.7 or 1.8, that is more feasible. But even that requires uh, immediate action uh, and very deep emission cuts, a minimum of 50% by 2030. Well, can that be done? Well, the answer there, I think, is yes. Uh, and I think we're showing that in Canberra. Uh, Canberra has reduced its emissions uh, by 40%. Uh, that's actually on 1990 level. When you look at 2005 levels, Canberra's emissions are more than 50% lower than they were in 2005. Um, and we have plans in place to decarbonize by 2045. We did some sums on the carbon budget on 
uh, Canberra's emission reduction plan. I think uh, Minister Shane Rattenberry can probably speak to that a bit more than I can. But my estimate was that if everyone did what Canberra did, uh, we'd meet the Paris targets at about 1.7 or 1.8 degrees Celsius. So it can be done, but Canberra has a decade jump on the rest of us because it started decarbonizing in 2011. So that makes it much harder uh, for the rest of us because we're waiting till 2020 at the earliest. So I just want to uh, round out by saying, how are we gonna meet this challenge put forward? Uh, and I wanna say that, first of all, coming out of COVID-19, coming out of 2020, this is what my colleague, John Schellenuber in, in Potsdam in Germany, he says, this is now the end game in climate change. We're either gonna make it coming out of COVID-19 or we're gonna blow the Paris talks. This, this is a fork in the road. Uh, and if we don't take the right fork, uh, I think it's going to be virtually impossible to get back onto uh, a good track. What do we mean by a fork in the road? What do we mean by the end game? All right, here are two things that we must do, not only here in Australia, uh, but around the world. Australia is hugely important in this first one, and that is we cannot have any new fossil fuel developments of any kind if we're serious about the Paris targets. That means no new coal, no new oil, no new gas, no new unconventional gas. Everything that's on the books in Australia has to be scrapped, full stop. And that's true in other countries as well, not just Australia. But Australia is a hugely important player because you and our exported emissions are the fifth biggest emitter in the world. We are the second or third biggest exporter of fossil fuels. So we have an enormous role to play in this end game, in this fork in the road. So that's one thing that we absolutely have to do if we want to have any chance of meeting the Paris targets, and that is no new fossil fuel developments. And of course, the existing developments will have to be phased out uh, before their economic lifetime is over. So the minimum we need to do there is to hit a 50% reduction uh, by 2030. That's 50% on um, 2005 levels. That will give us a fighting chance for the upper Paris targets. We will miss the lower Paris target, but that's the best I think we can do at this stage. So the, the last point I want to make as we start talking about how we're going to deal with this is this truly is the end game. If we do not take the opportunity that COVID-19 is presenting us by a jump start, we will reduce emissions this year by anywhere from 5 to 7%, uh, depending on what happens the second half of the year. That's a good start. But we cannot sit back and say, well, COVID-19 has done it. It hasn't. All it's done is pointed us a little bit in the right direction. So coming out of the COVID crisis, it's, it's over us. Which fork in the road are we going to take? Thanks very much, Imran. Uh, thanks, Will. I think you've, you've raised a couple of uh, really important points regarding carbon budget, Paris Agreement, the trigger points, and uh, regarding uh, uh, fossil fuel developments. I think what, what you've really out outlined, again, is, is, is the uh, scientific challenge uh, that we are in. The UN is calling this decade a very important decade for, for of action for sustainable development. The IPCC reports are, are very clear that we have to, we, this is the decade in which the emissions have to peak and we have to start uh, going towards a net zero path uh, uh, within this decade. So I think we're, we're uh, the challenge now is with all this scientific um, uh, uh, understanding and knowledge out there, the policy and the political front is not moving at the pace uh, that is necessary to address this challenge. And I, I, would, I would want to invite um, John Houston to really uh, run us through some of the policy, political chal uh, challenges and opportunities that we now face and, and uh, that we now have uh, uh, to, to address this challenge. So John Houston, uh, over to you. Uh, John, can you unmute your mic? Mike? I'm sorry. Um, let me say how pleased I am to be here tonight and have this opportunity to talk to you. Um, I have to begin by recognizing, though, that the reality that Will has just outlined has not sunk into our political leadership. Indeed, I don't think it's generally accepted globally that we would need to cut emissions by about 50% by 2030 if we're going to get to the upper end of the Paris objective by 2050. And um, 
you know, what concerns me is that uh, in Australia today, we've had a very unproductive period of, of um, what we've been called climate wars, you know, both sides of politics scoring points on each other, um, resulting basically in higher electricity and gas prices than would otherwise have been the case, which has impacted on, a, on both businesses and households. But more, more broadly, I mean, we've fallen well behind the objective that we should have, particularly, as Will says, when we are one of the largest emitters, I think the fifth largest emitter of, uh, of um, CO2 and other gases, if we recognise our significance as a, one of the largest exporters of fossil fuels in the world. Uh, so that reality hasn't sunk in. However, you know, to be optimistic, you could hope that now that we have handled uh, the um, COVID-19 crisis pretty well in this country, um, and uh, the focus is moving from the, the response to the crisis to uh, the so-called recovery phase, uh, that we need the political focus to shift to the significance of that opportunity. I mean, it is a genuine opportunity to think about how we might do what we need to do in relation to the challenge of climate change. Uh, to set uh, a recovery strategy, not just in terms of getting back to where we were, the snapback or bounce back as the government describes it just before the uh, COVID crisis, but actually to take a longer term strategic view, let's say a view to 2050 in this country, a, a three decade view as to how we could achieve being a low carbon society over that period and start to put in train a transition strategy sector by sector, which would achieve that outcome. Now, this is not going to be easy, and we still have a layer of the political debate that is committed to not only existing fossil fuel projects, but new fossil fuel projects, new Adani-type mines, new coal-fired power stations. As Will said, you've got to begin by, known, by accepting the reality of no more, you know, no new fossil fuel uh, projects and uh, the early phase out of those that exist today. And that's just in the Really, that's just in focus on the electricity sector. But if you were to take a sector by sector view, you know, what do we need to do between now and 2050 in the electricity sector to, to complete the transition to renewable energy? What do we need to do in the transport sector to go to electric vehicles, uh, autonomous trucking, whatever uh, the elements of, of that strategy? What should we be doing in the agricultural sector? And there's a sector that can actually achieve net zero emissions relatively easily. And in fact, it's an objective of some of the key players in the agricultural sector in this country, like the Grains Council, to actually demonstrate uh, their capacity to achieve that. And then go on with the other sectors of significance uh, and buildings and industrial processes and so on. Now, that's the challenge, I think, for government today. If you're going to have a recovery strategy, focus it in on the particular objective of achieving a low carbon society in Australia by the middle part of this century, and then looking sector by sector as to what can be done to actually achieve that and what needs to be done. Now, one of the things we've seen in terms of the community response to this pandemic has been a much greater adjustment, a much more rapid adjustment in the attitudes and behaviour and lives of, of, of both uh, ind individuals and, uh, well, individuals, businesses, institutions and so on. We've done much more than I think we'd ever imagined we'd do very quickly. In, some, in terms of, at a personal level, there's been a significant change in a lot of lifestyles. The way we work, the, weather, the way we travel, uh, the way we relate to each other, the use of technology like we're using tonight and how much uh, of a boost that can be to individual and uh, corporate uh, productivity, national productivity. I mean, uh, we've demonstrated a capacity to adjust. And I think what we're leading, what we're losing then, what we're missing, is the framework within which people would be encouraged to make those sort of adjustments. We've all got a part to play as individuals, as businesses, as broader civil society, uh, most of our institutions. We need to change what we do. We need to change our behaviour. We've demonstrated a capacity to be able to do that. Uh, what we've got to do now is have a framework within which people will be encouraged to do that. And as much as there's been a little bit of debate about how the government has responded to COVID-19 and whether they move fast enough or decisively enough in particular areas, there's no doubt that people accepted the fact there was a, a common objective, it was a shared objective, and we saw a coordinated uh, collaborative response. But even between state and federal governments in this country has been a more difficult uh, uh, objective to achieve. So the framework is what we need. We need to be able to look to the middle part of this century, start thinking longer term. And what I don't understand is when we look at our political landscape today, there are so many issues that have not been addressed. 
that are challenges that are of very significant, of great significance. For example, waste. We used to export waste. Uh, yet, you know, the technologies that exist in this country to turn that waste into biofuels, to turn it into electricity, to turn it into ethanol, to, you know, these are all new industries, new businesses, new jobs, which uh, and, and very regional in their focus, so that uh, the potential political gains from just addressing an element of the problem, waste, you can start to solve the problem. Same with fuel security. We've got about 21 days of fuel around the petrol stations. We rely on 44 ships a year bringing very dirty fuel, the second dirtiest fuel in the OECD from Singapore. Uh, we, can have, we should have a national fuel strategy. Again, working in a way that collectively we will be reducing emissions uh, in a very significant way. Now, these are specific examples of what's possible. The government has made some efforts in this regard. Uh, there have been a mandate sent to arena to look at a pathway for a, a renewal for a, a bioeconomy a circular economy pathway going out several decades we need what we need nationally is a pathway across the board we need to know how we're going to make it to net zero emissions or better by 2050 and uh, to a low carbon society let's say in australia by 2050 we need to have a shared objective and then we need to recognize individually and collectively how our behavior has to change to achieve that. So just in terms of the government's current challenge, it's now moving to the recovery phase. Uh, we need to have quite constructive, innovative thinking about how to move forward. And the only limit really should be the extent of our collective imagination as to how we might do this and how fast we might be able to do it. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, I think you, you've raised uh, uh, a number of issues on the policy and political front, um, and I think that, uh, that leads us uh, into um, our, our next uh, speaker um, and topic very well in terms of looking at um, the whole concept of well-being and, 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 uh, and, 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 and happiness in society. And uh, I'd, I'd really like to invite uh, Dr. Nageta Hunter to talk about human futures, to talk about the broader concept of well-being and see how it all pans together and how can we uh, uh, use this opportunity to address uh, both uh, planet and humanity together. So um, over to you, Dr. Hunter. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, Imran, and thanks so much for bringing everyone together tonight. Uh, I know we originally uh, planned to meet in person, and I'm sad that we're not, but I'm so glad that we're continuing the discussion, despite the technical limitations that we all face. Um, I've got a, a PowerPoint slide that I was going to run. Um, I'll just get, sorry, the technological side of it running. So, can you all see that screen? So, I was going to talk about um, climate change and health uh, as a way of thinking about well-being in the context of climate change. Uh, I would I often reflect that last year, even amongst my medical colleagues, there was quite a lot of uh, concern about whether climate change was the health threat that we saw itself demonstrating to be over the summer period. Uh, when we saw the hazardous bushfires really uh, affect a huge number of Australians. And so I think at the moment, if you ask the person on the street or people um, who are experiencing lockdown through the coronavirus, whether they um, estimate the mortality from coronavirus to be the similar to that from the bushfires, it's an interesting comparison because in fact, um, we know the number of people that are dying from the coronavirus. It's on the front page of the newspaper every day. We know that 34 people died from actually fighting bushfires and, and particularly tragically amongst those, the, the bushfire fighters. But how many people died from smoke? Well, one of the challenges in health and climate change is that the death certificate doesn't say climate change. We don't end up with a registry at the end of the year that says, well, this number of people died prematurely because of extreme weather events or because of temperature changes. But in fact, we've got quite a lot of data about this. So. Um, this was published a, a month or so ago in the Medical Journal of Australia and gives us a good estimate of uh, the number of people whose deaths occurred prematurely as a result of exposure to the hazardous air pollution that we know blanketed the large part of Eastern Australia. 
Um, and so the number of people estimated by this group out of the University of Tasmania is around 400 people uh, have died prematurely as a result of hazardous air pollution uh, and exposure to the bushfire smoke of our extraordinary summer. Heat is equally complicated, and uh, this was a recently published uh, study looking at the temperature change, looking at uh, places which will be nice to live and places that will be less nice to live. Heat and mortality in Australia are closely related, and we've known for a long time, really, that the hotter the summer, the higher the mortality uh, and the increase in the hospitalisations, particularly for our vulnerable populations. And so we know across the summer period that many hundreds of people died uh, likely as a result of exposure to the hazardous air pollution. It's similarly likely that a, a large proportion of people died as a consequence of those hot, hot temperatures and it was a really devastatingly hot summer. We also know that last year was an extraordinary drought and across Eastern Australia, we saw drought uh, as if we, that we'd really not seen before rivers running dry, towns without water, uh, and that the health consequences of those sorts of circumstances are also quite profound. We know amongst our regional communities, for example, that the mental health effects of drought are quite significant. And so we know that health effects and climate change are deeply related, that global warming sees our average temperatures are rising and that this experience won't be linear. We'll have bad years like the summer of 2019 and 20, and I'm hoping that the summer of 2021 won't be as bad from a heat perspective and a fire perspective. The health effects of climate change and our environment are really quite fascinating, and I think we underestimate the extent to which the environment influences our health. We know in medicine it's easy to, to focus on biology and sometimes we focus on the social determinants. Uh, the influence of the climate and the environment around us has no doubt been profoundly underestimated. And again, we see this playing out through the coronavirus pandemic where we understand a diagnosis of a viral infection. But that broader context that actually influences whether you're likely to die or not from that infection is a second line uh, consideration in, in our, our public approach. The health effects of climate change are seen through heat, they're seen through drought, they're seen through water shortages and through the extreme weather events. We'll see changes in patterns of diseases, including vector-borne diseases, and that this will continue in ways that we potentially we haven't quite imagined. I remember sitting down with a friend uh, at the beginning of this year wondering why we hadn't predicted smoke when we'd all been worried in 2019 about the severity of the summer that we were moving into. And within our little silos, we'd been concerned about heat, we'd been concerned about bushfires uh, in different departments at different universities or in different government areas. We need to work collaboratively across the different sectors in order to really fully appreciate the potential impacts of complex system changes like we see with climate change. So the other side of this coin, I think, is part of the narrative that will help us at this particular juncture. And I really take uh, Will's point that this is endgame territory very seriously. Cl tackling climate change is actually one of the greatest health opportunities we have. And if, if our, our primary point of action in terms of our political and economic behaviour is to protect the health and well-being of our communities, then acting on climate change should be centre to what we do is, with our governments. Uh, one of the, the stories or little analogies that I've been using regularly in the last couple of months is thinking that, that the summer was really awful, uh, that, that like, like many of us have already commented, uh, many of us were, were confronted over that summer period by a significant need to act quickly. The strong calls around Australia to rapidly decarbonise, uh, aiming for net zero by 2040 or sooner, if at all possible. There was a real sense of urgency and momentum. The way I've been thinking about it is we were sitting on the edge of the cliff. We, were, we knew that things had to change. We knew even how things could change. But we also knew that the changes were going to be extraordinarily difficult. Coronavirus has seen many of those elements put into play in ways that, again, we would really have struggled with as little as six months ago. We've seen changes to work, to our economic structure, to the way in which we travel, uh, overseas travel, flying, all of these elements which were so difficult to give up are now gone, or at least temporarily uh, dis disconnected. 
And so we've, we've got the most extraordinary opportunity for transformative change. And no doubt we'll hear from Shane and from the discussion about potential solutions that are out there. Uh, but I'm a little bit of a, a fan of the donut economic model um, and Kate Rayworth's work from Oxford. Um, and there, I'm really inspired by the fact that we could look at local solutions that have significant impacts both to our local communities, so individually, uh, to the societies in which we live and have resonance then into our, our global uh, societal structure. Uh, the interesting thing about models like this is that this is potentially a solution to our chronic non-communicable diseases, that by changing the way in which we design and structure our cities and our economic response after coronavirus, we might actually have a significant impact on heart disease, on hypertension, on diabetes. I often tell people I came into working in climate change because I'm a cardiologist and because I spend a lot of time talking to people about how and where they live, trying to manage the chronic non-communicable diseases that will affect almost all of us at some point in our adult life. And the way in which we can act to improve that through non-drug treatment particularly reflects how and where we live. Uh, by reducing our carbon footprint and increasing our social interconnectedness in these environments, we will significantly change rates of these diseases uh, and improve societal well-being. Health has motivated extraordinary social and economic change in Australia and around the world. And that we see this writ large through the coronavirus experience. We have joined together to combat this nasty infectious diseases disease. We've, we've used our understanding of, society, of science and medicine. We've really understood and informed our evidence-based approach on the basis of the fact that we understand about how infectious diseases are transmitted and how best to control them. We've used the science. Uh, and we've, we've used this to transform our society, to, to actually combat an extra, extraordinary threat. We need to continue this, this recovery. We need to use these themes of science and looking towards the future uh, to generate a, a, a really extraordinary opportunity for our human future. Thanks, uh, uh, thanks uh, Anna Greta. I think you've laid out um, uh, uh, the parameters uh, regarding the health and well-being, and in particular, I think your point that uh, it is also a great opportunity to address the health issues um, as we address uh, uh, climate change. I think I think I think it's 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 really important to bear in mind in terms of the integrated nature of the whole challenge, where where uh, everything is so connected, and as we have seen um, uh, in in the COVID nineteen situation as well, which is a, a pandemic situation, but but given the, the actions that we are taking is actually, some of the actions are actually helping address uh, climate change through less, through no travel actually <laughs> in these days. And um, so I think, I think we're now uh, in a situation where we can invite um, Minister Rattenbury to really uh, talk about climate solutions on ground. And, and in particular from the Paris Agreement point of view, um, the the uh, determined, national determined actions at the city state level are are extremely important, and I think Canberra being a leader in that in, in this area, um, it would be nice to also learn about how ACT is addressing both challenges in terms of looking at these opportunities to address the wider existential challenge on climate change um, and climate emergency. Um, so, Minister Rattenbury, over to you. Well, thank you, Martin. and good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to join you uh, for this webinar on the lands of the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians of Canberra and our surrounding regions. I guess I've been really reflecting on the fact that as we grapple with this global pandemic, the bad news is that this is not the only crisis we have to deal with because, of course, in the background, we also remain in the middle of a climate change emergency, and that's been well spelled out by uh, the previous speakers tonight. There is, of course, good news as well, and I'll come to that shortly, but it is right that COVID-19 is currently dominating our attention. It must necessarily do so. But climate change also presents serious ongoing threats to our health, to the economy, to the environment, and of course, to future generations. If we escape COVID, but don't deal with climate change, we are almost literally stepping out of the frying pan and into the fire. The heat waves fueled by climate change are responsible for more deaths around the world than any other natural disaster. Uh, climate change also increases the risks of bushfires, droughts, and even some bloodborne diseases. 
which are all threats to human health. And I think Anna Greta's made a really good summary of that. Uh, and I was going to touch on that Medical Journal of Australia article and research that she showed, which identified 417 estimated excess deaths across Australia's east coast over the summer because of the bushfires. That report also refers to thousands of hospitalizations for cardiovascular and respiratory problems. So it really underlines the scale, and whilst it hasn't been as documented as the COVID case numbers, uh, the scale was definitely there. Now, of course, there are many other threats from climate change, and there is, of course, the social upheaval, the economic up costs, the environmental destruction. We've just seen over summer uh, the Great Barrier Reef has suffered its third mass bleaching event in five years, and that's had almost no coverage because coronavirus has taken over the media space. But it is a tragedy and one that has, has massive economic and environmental ramifications. <clears throat> so what we know, and Will's outlined this in his remarks, is that basically every element of life on the planet will be somehow affected by climate change. And so... I think this is something we really need to keep in mind when we hear people start talking about snapping back to normal or getting back to normal as fast as possible. Uh, people are longing for an escape from COVID and a return to normal. And certainly compared to the current situation, normal looks pretty good right now. But the reality is that we cannot simply go back to the normal that we've been in because it's not a sustainable path for us. It's a trajectory where we fail to address climate change and where we increasingly suffer the environmental health and economic punishments that stem from that failure. Uh, and so we can't just return to normal. Instead, we need to create a better normal. We create, need to create a new normal that puts us on that pathway to sustainability. Now, creating a better normal means recovering from this pandemic but in a way that doesn't just expose us to other global threats like climate change. We should aim to transition our economy to a clean and green economy. And that is one that values climate change science, the concept of intergenerational equity, and the limited resources of the planet. It also means recovering in a way that elevates the values of compassion, of fairness, and looking forward and looking after the more vulnerable people in our community. Now, a crisis like COVID always highlights those in, in ongoing inequities in the world. And we've certainly seen that playing out in a range of ways, which I'm sure you've all read about in various publications. Now, these values that I'm talking about, and this sort of idea of a better normal is what we call a Green New Deal. And certainly as a Greens Member of Parliament, that's what we're campaigning for, a Green New Deal that creates a clean, green economy and which ensures no one is left behind. It gives the climate crisis the import it deserves, and it puts people at the heart of decision-making. The Green New Deal reconfigures our economy so that it stays prosperous, but remains sustainable at the same time. It rejects the model that endless, the economic model it endlessly consumes at the expense of everything else. And this is where we get to the good news, because although things seem grim right now, creating a better normal via a Green New Deal is actually possible. Even as we seem at our lowest point, struggling as we are through this pandemic situation, we really have an unprecedented opportunity to rebuild with new and better ideas. Now, I think it's worth pointing out that building a clean green economy is perfectly compatible with traditional concepts of economic success. If we look at renewable energy, for example, on market terms alone, renewable energy is already the best and most economical investment for new power generation. It's the cheapest new form of electricity we can build. Clearly, coal is dead, not only because it's incompatible with a future healthy planet, because it's also uneconomical. Renewable energy is rocketing into the grid. It is reducing prices, and we're seeing that come through in our electricity bills this year. Uh, but we also know that it creates jobs and the example here in the ACT where as we've moved to 100% renewable electricity is a great case study in that where we've seen extraordinary job growth here in our own city uh, with a range of companies putting their headquarters here creating new job opportunities uh, and highly skilled job opportunities for our university-led town. 
The Australian energy market operator recently released a plan showing how Australia's main grid could be powered by 75% renewables by just 2025. Now, this is not an organisation known for their sort of radical or bold predictions. And so for me, that means that it is absolutely possible. If AOMO, if AEMO thinks it's possible, then uh, I think that it clearly is. Roscano, of course, has shown how we could be powered by 100% renewables by the early 2030s and keep energy prices low at the same time. And Professor Garno has also shown how, with the right policy settings, Australia could really unleash economic success using renewables, paving the way for new industries like green manufacturing. Another report's come out today, have just shown that Australia could have an enormous new industry with green steel production, which we could export to the world. And it would create far more jobs in rural and regional areas than we currently see in the fossil fuel industries. Uh, Professor Garner, of course, has talked about Australia being a renewable energy superpower. And the work Professor Finkel has done on Australia's hydrogen strategy, I think, matches that and shows the economic opportunities that are there to have a prosperous but sustainable society. And these, of course, are all those classic cliched win-wins where we get a win for the environment, but also we maintain a quality of life and of economic opportunity. And that, I think, sums up what a Green New Deal can do. We saw the Clean Energy Council release a clean recovery plan last week that showed renewables investment could create over 50,000 new direct jobs in Australia and many more indirect jobs. These examples all underline what a Green New Deal can deliver in the future. For the ACT, having decarbonised electricity, we are now largely focused on the remaining emitting sectors, which are our transport sector and our gas sector, and, how, and also climate change adaptation. This means we need to pursue policies and investments such as zero emissions transport, a green urban design, zero emissions buildings, phasing out fossil gas, and planting trees and other green infrastructure across our city to create that more sustainable future. Uh, so in the classic triple bottom line analysis, let me talk about the significant social benefits of taking these uh, climate change actions at a localised level and delivering not just a win-win, but all, I guess a triple win. And the great news about zero emission transport, green urban design and the like is they help build a healthy and sustainable city, a city that looks after people and that people enjoy living in. We've seen that again in the current pandemic, the things that people really value are things, I and mean, we felt very fortunate here in Canberra to have the open spaces we can go to uh, at times where we have to seek that social distancing. Now, of course, trees, this is a, a garden city, but of course those trees help to mitigate the urban heat island effect, which is worsening due to climate change. They are also one of the most loved features of this city for their amenity, their aesthetics, but also as a wildlife habitat. Energy efficiency in all electric buildings, of course, help reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but they also make residents much more comfortable. They protect them from the extremes of heat and cold and defend against high energy bills, which always hit the most vulnerable in society the hardest. And so if we can support and subsidize these building improvements, then we help the climate at the same time as we help people, the very essence of the Green New Deal. Now lastly, if we consider sustainable urban design, whereby we plan our cities to prioritise people and sustainable transport, like light rail, buses and cycling instead of cars, this not only reduces transport emissions, but it also has a positive social effects. It helps people out of transport poverty to ensure that they aren't dependent on cars, which are a significant part of the household budget each year. But it also improves people's health. It means less local pollution, both air and noise pollution, and it reactivates public space. It makes it a more welcoming environment than simply having little aluminium boxes whizzing by where you have no interaction with other people. And we've been able to bring some of these measures in as part of our COVID-19 response here in the ACT in our stimulus packages. We've had it included funding for solar PV, battery storage, energy efficiency projects at public buildings and public housing, as well as more funding for walking and cycling infrastructure. But we need to do this on a much grander scale if we are to create a truly sustainable city. My last point is that the pandemic has already taught us several lessons about how we can kickstart this Green New Deal. 
And I know Greta touched on a few of these points. We've all learned how to work from home. And just a few years ago, everybody said these things weren't possible. Uh, those of us in local governments will know that a small change in commuting habits can make a really big difference to traffic and the required traffic infrastructure. It's all about smoothing out the peak, or if we use current language, uh, flattening the curve. But if we can actually create different commuting habits and different working from home habits, we don't need to spend so much money on simply growing road infrastructure all the time, which is enormously expensive and which is an endless cycle. Uh, anyone who studies these sort of things will tell you that simply building more road capacity leads to greater levels of congestion. Uh, perhaps, I think most importantly, the pandemic has shown us that when they need to, governments can be very good at listening to the advice from scientists and rapidly mobilising and acting. That is something that we desperately need on climate change. And I, this has been commented widely, I've seen quite a few memes on it, uh, but really if the federal government can listen to these scientists when it comes to a global pandemic, we need them to listen to people like Will Stefan and others who have laid out very clearly what the challenge is in front of us. The science is there. We simply now need to put the measures in place to do it. We need a national cabinet to address climate change. We need the sort of focus that we've seen in recent weeks to help us tackle this existential threat to us and the environment that we live in. Uh, so I think I will simply end on that positive note, having started perhaps on the, on the more gloomy end of the spectrum by saying that it is well within our abilities to create a better normal and enact this Green New Deal. We need it, we must get it done. The scientists tell us that we have to do it. And I think that we have learnt over the last few months that we do have it within us to make that rapid transition. Thanks very much, Imran. Uh, thanks, uh, Minister Shane. Um, I think uh, in particular for highlighting elements of Green New Deal and I think how, how it can work for both climate and economy and, and increasing livelihoods, increasing job, uh, uh, jobs, uh, particularly jobs in, in this environment, which, are, which is extremely, people are losing jobs on a daily basis. And I think how can you use this opportunity um, uh, to address both? One of the things uh, that emerged, um, you know, particularly that will highlight it in terms of the carbon budget, and it 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 occurs to me that we're we're already when uh, when we think about a household budget, we, uh, how, in our household we think about a household budget. Uh, pe uh, people in Australia and worldwide are very concerned about budget deficits, but but when it comes to a carbon budget, um, I think that that understanding that we're really um, exhausting the limits of the planet it has not been really internalized uh, within the society at a level that people are, um, can take transformative actions. Um, so I think that's where government leadership, enabling policies um, uh, is, is extremely important. Now, what, uh, uh, what uh, Minister Shane, you outline in terms of listening to science, I think we, we are seeing that not just in Australia, but globally. Um, the governments are listening to scientists and listening to health experts in looking at economic experts in looking at economy and health response. So, when, but when, when it goes, um, when we look at climate change, uh, the same uh, level of uh, response varies worldwide. Um, I, and and it, it happens for a number of reasons. I mean, um, so I think it would be interesting to really look at look at why. Um, during Australian bushfire um, uh, crisis, um, I was uh, also involved in a lot of discussion that this is going to be the this is the new normal. Uh, the Australian bushfires were predicted by scientists way back in in, uh, in the in the Ghana review and other reviews that are coming that this is this uh, this is going to happen. Um, and uh, the discussion was that this is Australian bushfire crisis is now. Uh, the opportunity to reset everything. Uh, now the whole issue in COVID is, is this is an opportunity to reset everything. So I think I would like to sort of bring this to the panel is, is this an opportunity? Um, we always talk of a crisis and as, an, as another opportunity for a reset. Uh, but are we, are we going to have another reset or not? Or are we just going to pass through this with normal um, measures um, that are not addressing both challenges. So I, I, I'll, I'll ask the panel to sort of take up, take this up. John, I am concerned that an, that a feature of our politics these days, which is a very short-term focus point scoring sort of game, very negative, 
is that when you have a challenge like a flood, a drought, I should say, a flood, a bushfire, the cynical political reaction is, look, it'll ultimately pass. <laughs> you know, ultimately, it will drought, the, rain, the drought will be broken, it will rain, uh, the bushfire season will end, uh, the floods will, will, will turn over, will, will, will end. And um, then we go on to the future without actually thinking about whether, in fact, we shouldn't be learning from that and, and um, putting in place or uh, preparing better for the next time around. We know with climate change that the extreme weather events are going to occur, occur with greater frequency and intensity. So wouldn't you think that, uh, say, in response to the drought, that you'd start putting in place policies that would like make our soils more drought resistant? Some regenerative agriculture, which is pretty simple, straightforward changes to farming techniques and practices, which would improve the carbon content of the soil and um, give the farmers another income as they sell the carbon credits for doing that. At the same time, make our drought, make our soils more drought resistant, more resilient. Uh, and, you know, we just don't do that. We just move on to, as it's happened, we move from the drought to the bushfires to the COVID. And uh, the recovery focus out of COVID is let's just get those jobs back one way or another, go back to the way we were and, um, you know, learn nothing from the process. Don't take advantage of the change in attitudes and the change in behaviour that have been very important, I think structurally important in response to the, the COVID-19 crisis. So I'm not optimistic. It's, it's not easy to get government to change the way it, it operates, but you need leadership. You need somebody prepared to stand out and say, look, enough's enough. We can't go back to the way we were. The way we were was not focused on the climate issue at all, for example. Uh, we need to do more and we should take this opportunity now to build a new future take a new pathway to a, a low carbon Australia by the middle part of this century. Uh, Anna Greta, you wanted Yeah, to... no, I just wanted to follow on from John's comments there. There were a few things. Um, firstly, the work for the Commission for the Human Future, and John, is, of course, is the chair of the Commission, um, and I'm the Human Futures Fellow from ANU for the, the year. Um, and I just thought I'd highlight the report that we released a few weeks ago, which was our first round table discussion. The Commission's identified 10 catastrophic and existential risks and its issues around environment are really in the forefront. Climate change, water scarcity, food insecurity, issues to do with pollution and populations that are spread beyond what we, we can actually support. Um, and in amongst this list of existential and catastrophic lists, of course, is pandemics, um, nuclear war, and then the capacity that we, we really have. And you, you see, it's a human experience. And John just exp explained the politics of it very well. We live through the crisis. So we live through the drought and we know that it's always going to rain. We've got this, it's a, maybe it's a delusion that things, that things won't affect us. Um, that we don't need to tackle this, this major and potentially very serious threat. Um, and so I think the take home messages from the, the work that's been done by the Commission for the Human Future so far are that there's a tremendous benefit to understanding science and looking at the scientific evidence to inform decision making and really to inform public policy. And then secondly, that we really desperately need to move away from short termism. So short termism takes us to the drought that is broken. It takes us to the next lot of rain. It takes us to the next crisis that will distract us from what's in front of us right now. Um, and we need to be planning as a society, not just for what life will be like in September when they try to reduce the job keeper and job seeker allowances again, but what it's going to be like when our children are in, in, in government, when our, our grandchildren are trying to live in a world which is four or five degrees warmer on average than it is now. And so how do we inform into our science and our decision and into our policy making science as a core principle, understanding evidence, looking at the, the pros and cons cons of situations, and then also uh, being able to look beyond the short term to the longer term. Um, I'll go back to my cliff analogy. You know, I, I've been in a few of the different climate events in the last year or two, probably not as many as other, the other speakers, but uh, we've all been there. There was an extraordinarily uh, growing intensity for urgent action in the climate change movement. We understand the science. We, we read Will Steffen's analyses. We understand that the, the time is of the essence and we need to change now. And yet that translation for how to act, that, that's what, what is needing to be really advanced, I think, in the climate change movement. What, what does it look like? 
coronavirus shows us what it looks like. It looks, it shows us what it looks like when we stop flying, when we don't drive, when, when, we, when we have significant amounts of unemployment that we need to contend with. Um, and I think when we're framing our climate change response, keeping the human experience front and centre is so, so important. And we've learning that from coronavirus, that, that perhaps one of the best ways to contend with climate change is thinking about how we work and how we support communities in ways that are just and equitable, that provide adequate resources that are shared across large populations. Thanks, Anna Good. Uh, Will, do you want to come in on this point? Yeah, look, I, th I think there have been a couple of really good um, uh, interjections already on that. The one point I would simply add to this, and this is a bit responding to, to John's challenge, which I think is a very good one, that there is, I think, quite a strong tendency with the present government and probably many in society to try to snap back to what we had before without thinking at all about what this entails. So how do you deal with that? Uh, one of the things I talk about a lot in the climate system are things called tipping points. Uh, and those are, are processes where they seem to be uh, part of the system like the Greenland ice sheet or the Amazon rainforest, which look to be very stable if, as, as you push them and push them. And suddenly they tip, they, they change suddenly or irreversibly or both, uh, just when a critical threshold is passed. But interestingly, there's quite a growing literature on social tipping points too that we humans and our societies are also complex systems uh, and we can undergo rapid change as we have in response to COVID-19. Uh, but uh, I think Anna Greta was just putting a finger on it is that there is a feeling now uh, in many parts of our community, in, in the demonstrations you go to, in the discussions you have, that something is afoot. Uh, and the thing is that the people in power will be the last people probably to see this coming. Uh, so the hope is that we just keep pushing, and, and I would encourage everyone in your own way, whatever you feel comfortable with, whether it's Extinction Rebellion or writing to your MP or whatever, uh, just keep, it, keep upping the pressure. And uh, I'm hoping that within the next few years, we're very close to a social tipping point on the climate issue. Uh, I think a big thing that's helping us is all the really positive things in the technology, in the employment, in the social benefits of switching away from fossil fuels, uh, that really is eroding quite strongly, I think, uh, the long-term case for fossil fuels. So all this is building. Uh, let's all keep pushing. Let's not lose uh, confidence or, or lose uh, uh, our, our, um, uh, our feeling of getting at this, because uh, I think we can push, uh, push Australia over a tipping point, and I think it's probably social tipping point. I think it's probably closer than most people think. Um, Mr. Shen? Sure, I actually segue from Rule's discussion of tipping points. I'm really intrigued as to where the community is going to go after this. We've had a year in which between the bushfires and COVID, people's sense of the country we live in, the world we live in, what our lives are, has been fundamentally challenged in ways that for have not been with us in, in recent history. You know, in my lifetime, I've not seen such fundamental impacts is particularly we've seen with COVID, uh, but even with the way the bushfires impacted on the East Coast over the summer. And so I think what that's done is, t is force people to question what's important, uh, what matters and where things are going beyond the usual circles. You know, I think for those that talk about climate change and go to rallies, there's a sort of a sense of it, but I think it's opened some of these questions up to a much broader segment of the community. And I think that's the opportunity uh, that speaks to Will's issue of can we get to a tipping point. Um, that said, I think there's going to be, you know, some people are going to want to snap back. And so there's also an opportunity there for those who argue for a different future, and this is where this sort of Green New Deal comes in, to sort of paint a different possibility at a time when people are wondering what is next. Uh, thanks, Shane. Um, we've, we've got a related question um, coming in um, through the attendees, uh, Ms. An Ahmed. Um, how have uh, the behavior of people around the world uh, reacting um, to COVID-19 informed us about how people will react to climate emergency? Does it inform us about the capabilities of some cultures, countries? So, panel? I think for a lot of us, it's probably reinforced our concern about the United States 
<laughs> you know, in the sense it is one of the, of course, one of the great nations of human history and full of amazing capability and potential, but is so polarized and so uh, inwardly focused, particularly at the moment that, uh, you know, that's played out with the pandemic, but we need their leadership on climate change and the draw from the Paris Accord, I think has, is, is the issue that we're facing when it comes to climate. I think just on the US, though, it's quite interesting to watch the different reactions. As you say, the community has been clearly divided and part of Trump's strategy is to divide, uh, mm. you know, to, to really force division in society. But as uh, the uh, early um, relaxations of restrictions are taking effect in different states, there's a significant body of people who are nervous about that. Mm. Perhaps we shouldn't be doing this. Perhaps we should be you know, hanging in there a bit longer. And uh, I'm surprised at how those attitudes have changed. Uh, you know, you might not have expected that there would be that sort of concern. And that uh, concern, I think, can be um, extrapolated to some of the other dimensions of the, the challenges that are before a country like the United States or Australia right now. People know. I mean, one of the points that I thought came out of the bushfire experience in Australia was although Morrison didn't want to mention climate change as a factor in bushfires, ultimately had to. But the community's view was, well, God, you know, we're taking that for granted. You know, mm -hmm. We're very dry climate. We're, continent, we're getting drier. Uh, water shortage is a major issue for us. Uh, and, um, you know, and what are you going to do about it? And don't pretend that it's not linked to climate. So I think that, that, that change is taking place. And I get great heart from the fact that I think the next generation, the younger generation, has manifested in student protests, but more broadly. And once they start voting, it's going to be very difficult to convince them otherwise that there shouldn't be significant decisive action on something like climate, because they know that it's being pushed to their generation. Uh, John, well, just one of the interesting points uh, that uh, came out not um, uh, from the bushfire, um, and in terms of the ref uh, refugee, uh, it's a very political issue uh, in Australia, but for the first, I think, um, for the first time we were seeing domestic climate refugees movement within Australia due to the bushfires. And I think these, these are the issues that are now coming up. And I think um, taking a clue from what Will basically said is looking at the positive spin, spins and, and actions that are happening, uh, particularly with regards to the social tipping points. If we see around the world, even within Australia, across the state level, in the US, across the state level, look at California, the sixth largest economy in the world and what's, what's happening there in Europe, it's, they're going in a big way in terms of uh, um, uh, a new deal, uh, a green new deal um, in terms of their action. So I think, I think there are lots of, finger uh, lots of positives that are happening um, within the society. Um, Anna Greta, have you addressed this point? Ah, I, I, I guess just following on from that, I, I was um, thinking about uh, the microgrid structures and I was listening to a great podcast from the Farmers for Climate Action uh, today, talking about the experience in northeastern Victoria um, and the, the benefits of a, of a, on a local level of a, a, a town or a, a, a small city uh, making that trans transition towards being 100% renewable in their e electricity. And it's not just about reducing the carbon footprint of the town, it's really about changing economic and social interaction uh, within towns and within within social uh, networks. And so that, that stuff potentially has quite profound health benefits. It has social benefits. It has benefits um, which are well beyond simply just uh, reducing the carbon footprint. Um, and so I, I think I think those those narratives of, of what we can do locally, as Will said, what we, you know, uh, what we feel comfortable with within our own lives, individual change can matter. And we can use uh, the ideas that are circulating and percolating up through, throughout the world to really help us to inform uh, this process of transformative change. Thanks, Anna we, we, uh, we have a, a particular question for Will uh, from Matt Georgeson. Uh, does Will have some info on how much emissions are being reduced during due to the pandemic? And also any thoughts on how to keep them lower? Okay, first question, yes, there have been estimates uh, they're usually in the range of 5% to 7%. Uh, we won't know for sure because we don't know how we're going to come out, how soon and, and in what way we're going to come out. But those are the estimates that are there. Um, uh, 
just a couple of comparisons. The, the global financial crisis also reduced emissions, I think, in 2008 or 2009, but not by that much. That was 2 or 3%, I believe. So this is having a more significant effect on emissions than the GFC. Uh, what happens in the longer term depends on what pathway we take out of this. Uh, if we uh, snap back, so to speak, to the old way of doing things, I would say that uh, 2021 emissions will be at least as high as 2019. Uh, we learned from the GFC that in fact there was a surge in emissions coming out of the GFC uh, and, and as, as things picked up uh, very rapidly. So this is why I made that point in my talk that this is the fork in the road, that we really have to do everything we can over the next few months uh, to make sure that uh, uh, people do take seriously the fact that there is a, a better future out there, the Green New Deal, uh, all the different uh, social benefits, health benefits we can get from taking a different direction. Uh, and that's why we need that, that social tipping point now. Because if we snap back into the old system, um, the upper Paris target will basically be out of our reach later this decade. So we really don't have much uh, much time at all to get this right. Uh, yeah, so could I just add there that I don't think um, most people would accept a recession as an effective way of reducing emissions. No. And, and um, you know, I know that I hear arguments that, oh, well, you know, we've moved substantially towards our objective now because of what's in the, in the process of uh, the response to COVID-19. But that's really a silly way to look at it. Um, that's a negative message. The positive message is that there are real opportunities to actually restructure the Australian economic and social systems in a way that will significantly reduce emissions to the benefit of everyone in terms of more growth, more jobs, more investment, so on. And I think that's, that's the, the message we've got to get out. I mean, your, your fork in the road's right. I just don't understand why they don't want to see it. And I would think in political terms, the leaders that are prepared to stand up and argue that from now on will get a lot of, you know, the electorate will cut them a lot of slack compared to an attempt to just go back to the way we were and uh, have interminable debates about whether or not you should uh, increase new start or, you know, or keep job keeper or job, job seeker or job keeper or whatever. So I, I think it is an opportunity for somebody to recognise that if government were to recognise the significance of the problem and were to put in place a framework, and that's really what you're doing, a framework for the pathway, to a low carbon society by the middle part of this century, you'll be an election winner for a long time, in my view. I just uh, unfortunately that that sort of view falls on barren ground. And what do I know, I lost an election anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. But I do think it's, it, it's that change in thinking that's got to take place. John, one of the things that I, I don't hear particularly, I mean, with all the good, good actions that the uh, Commonwealth government is doing in, in, in addressing COVID-19, um, they are not uh, trying to mention climate change or anything to, related to that. While some of the, um, and a green recovery and and is this is this a political sort of a problem for them? Not sort of dealing with it in an integrated manner because they have an opportunity to do so, and they are not using that. They're, they're complex individuals. On the one hand, they say we're taking medical advice, we're relying on the science, All right? And um, yet they don't really want to rely on the science, which is, I think, much more substantive in terms of, uh, of climate. Um, you know, they, they uh, recognise that, uh, that people have changed behaviour. And it's not such a big ask to get people to change behaviour collaboratively uh, to a, a collective good. Uh, they don't seem to recognise that. And they don't want to recognise that. So that inconsistency in response is, uh, is very worrying. Uh, I think it's, it's more than that, isn't it? I mean, at the, at the same time as we're responding to coronavirus and listening to science, there's talk of winding back environmental regulations that will have, you know, detrimental effects on biodiversity and on, on restoration of natural environment that's been so badly decimated by the bushfires. Um, and so, so I, I feel like they're trying to run two separate narratives. They've got this narrative of we listen to science and we take expert advice on the one hand, which has been the only way that they can frame their coronavirus response. And on the other side, this ongoing blatant disregard um, for, for good quality scientific advice into, uh, into their science policy sphere. Yep. Hey, Martin, it's interesting if you listen to most of the economic predictions that are around, people are saying it's going to take extended effort by government to bring the economy back in some form. Now, a lot of that is in the sort of old normal, and I'm arguing for a better normal. But 
but I, one of the questions in the chat box is from Helen saying, well, what would the three steps be needed to get the Green New Deal? And this is the perfect moment to start those steps because the first step is you need to set the long-term goal and be really clear about it. And so our long-term goal would be to be carbon neutral by 2045 or something like that. Then you need to set a plan for the next, say, five years. And I say five years because I don't, the way technology is changing, the world's changing, any kind of plan is only going to be valid for sort of roughly that period of time. And you need to put in the really practical steps that you undertake. And then the third step is you've just got to start doing it. You start spending the money, making the legislative changes. And as we're coming out of this and starting to define what things are going to look like in the future, it's the perfect moment to begin those three steps in my view. I recall a, a, um, a quote that's attributed to Churchill that uh, plans really don't matter. It's planning that matters. But we don't have that planning in this country. We don't have that medium term thinking or structural thinking. There are a lot of structural Im impediments to our economic and social life pre, pre COVID-19. And are we going to go back to the wall of those, which were just being kicked down the road rather than being addressed? I mean, it's not a realistic uh, response. And I find this, um, schizophrenic reaction of government. On the one hand, we're going to rely on medical advice, but we're going to ignore the science on climate. <laughs> it's just, I, I just, you know, it's enough to keep you up all night. Okay, going to our, um, I think, um, just on this question um, that um, uh, Shane has picked up on uh, uh, from Helen Wilson, if any of um, the panelists would like to sort of ask, I mean, oh, what she's bringing into discussion is, uh, is what are the three stages in a Green New Deal? And, 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 and if Will and Aaron Greta want to say anything on this, in the, on this question before we move to another one? Uh, I, I developed in my brain three, my three favourite things to do in response to climate change last year. And it's not a Green New Deal model, but it is a sort of inform, informs in that. One is to make um, climate change uh, central to all policy areas of, of federal government, and that's the national cabinet type response. But we, we really need to see climate change represented, not just in the Department of Environment, but well across all aspects of government decision making at all levels of government. Uh, the second thing was to start to really value the environment in a way that saw employment growth in that area so that you pay people to protect the environment and you can do that through pricing carbon, through paying our farmers to, to work in a carbon neutral way, to, to go out and to protect the natural environment around us because if we don't protect the natural environment around us, our health and well-being also suffers and so beginning to really appreciate the synergy of human health and environmental health at the same time and to price that according accordingly. And my, my final thing was thinking and probably reflecting the, the frustration with, with politics at all sorts of different levels, but that working in your own community is a really powerful place to be. Um, and when I was talking to people about how to, how to get the best health response uh, from a heat, for, for against the heat waves that we faced over summer, um, the answer to that is to look after each other locally. And so, so to get to know your neighbours, to get to know your own local resources um, and to work together collectively. And you see that through these power solutions and through, through uh, communities that have banded together in their response to the bushfires. And so working locally was my third element. So put, carbon, uh, put uh, climate change at the centre of all, all policy response. Let's, let's price our, and protect our environment through our economic and employment mechanisms and let's work locally, looking after each other. Yeah, look, I think I would have, I would establish a, trans, a climate a emissions reduction transition or transition climate transition commission, independent of government. Get it out of politics, and then give it long term uh, funding and uh, independence, along the lines of a reserve bank type independence to actually call the shots in this, challenge both sides or all political players really uh, as to the way we should go forward. I think secondly, to pick up on a, a Greta's point, an emissions impact statement on every major cabinet submission would be fundamentally important. Mm. And the third thing as an economist is I put a price on carbon, a genuine market price on carbon. And, and those three things I think could give you a framework within which you can really move forward on, the, in, on, this, uh, on this issue and be seen to be doing so. But to be playing around like the Queensland government's done this week with its attitude to some of the coal projects and gas projects, uh, you know, the, the, the notional support for Adani, even the banks and insurance companies won't support it. Uh, you know, this is just uh, 
very ridiculous short-term politics. It, it's for some sort of perceived short-term political advantage, which is really dead set against our national interest in the longer term. Will, do you want, do you want to add anything? Yeah, uh, look, I would just like to um, scale up what uh, Anagreta was saying, because I think she hit the three major challenges of the, of the Anthropocene, that word I think you used at the beginning, Imran, which is the fact that we are in a new geological epoch, one driven by humans. So you need to do the, the, the three things she's talking about at scale. One is you need to, to, to stabilize the climate system. As long as you've got a climate system uh, out of control, you're not going to have uh, well-functioning human societies, uh, and you're going to hammer the biosphere. The second thing is you actually, we actually now have to start regenerating the biosphere rather than degrading it. Uh, and with or without climate change. That has to happen. And the third thing is we have to build healthier societies uh, that are built around well-being. I'm channeling Kay Rayworth here a bit. Uh, and people ask me, well, what's the most important thing there? Well, I don't know. But one thing that I think is pretty central to human well-being is this idea of equity or, or equality. If you keep growing inequality uh, like we are, within countries and between countries, you're gonna have social problems. So looking at the big picture Anthropocene sort of thing, we need to stabilize the climate, we need to regenerate the biosphere, and we need to make ourselves socially and mentally and physically healthier. Uh, and that requires a social response, not just an individual response. Well, those are my three. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, we, we, we have some excellent questions that I'm going to rush through before we end. Uh, we're reaching close to our finishing time. Um, we have 10 minutes left, I think, or slightly over. Um, uh, there's a question from Craig uh, Crawford, uh, and in the, there are a few questions that are related to what we are what we have been discussing. Uh, who could lead uh, from Kate? Who could lead a public discussion about what how about what we have learned from COVID nineteen uh, that could be used to mitigate climate change? John, uh, the chief scientist. Chief scientist. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, you gotta, if you want to pick one person, I guess he's in a position to actually do that. Mm -hmm. but you need a lot of support. And, uh, you know, there should be collective leadership in a lot of this. It's very difficult to say, well, a particular <laughs> individual. I mean, you could say Shane uh, Rattenberg because uh, they've basically made substantial progress at a territory level. Uh, they're leading the way. They're setting an example for what needs to be done recognised uh, that they've been successful in power, but you've still got transport and buildings and, and, and so on to go to actually get on top of the task. But okay. Hard to pick an individual to do that. No, Kate is now uh, uh, clarifying. She, did, she, was, she didn't mean one person. I think, I think it, what, you're, what, you're, what you're alluding to and what you're saying is it's a collective response, and I think it's a collective endeavour. And every, everybody, um, and climate change is an issue that, uh, unlike smoking or other, which you can... Uh, handle at an individual level. I, I think it's a collect carbon is everywhere, so it is a collective action uh, yeah. by different stakeholders. Yeah, someone put up Norman Swan, which I thought was not a bad nomination. But mm -hmm. um, if we go back to John's earlier comment about having a climate change authority. I mean, if you look at how the pandemic has played out, we've had the chief health officer and the chief health officers from each state and territory working together to provide that national advice. And I think that's the sort of model where you've got your experts in the field, and then sort of, you know, and they've channeled into the national cabinet, it, it does point to that collective effort that needs to be made. And so you're taking both the collective knowledge and the collective political capability. I think that's why we've been able to be effective on the pandemic in the way that we have. Um, uh, let me get to a next question by Sumaya Kasim. Um, what we have seen with our governments is a terrible tendency to be influenced by the big powerful lobbies of oil and coal. What can we do to make sure our governments do what is necessary? Uh, there are many things you can do. You can change campaign funding, for example. Uh, I'd start there, uh, federal ICAC, uh, to uh, look at uh, potentially corrupt uh, or if, uh, a behavior which is influential on government in an unjustified way against the national interest. Um, I think that uh, you need to address the significance of those lobby groups and their power base. There's no doubt that the, the fuel lobby in this country is extremely strong and it's, uh, it's, it's lent us through the world, which uh, we quite happily burn the second dirtiest, dirtiest fuel in the OECD in this country. 
uh, you know, if we were to go to Euro 6 emission standards on our cars and drive on that fuel, they probably wouldn't get out of the showroom. You know, we've, we haven't got fuel standards that make any sense. We haven't got uh, emission standards on vehicles that make any sense. And that's all because of that power lobby. And when you go to the next stage about biofuels and alternative fuels, biodiesel, ethanol and so on, the, few, the influence of that particular lobby is really enormous and, uh, and, and unjustified. So it needs to be exposed. We do have bodies like the ACCC to do that, but they seem powerless to address it. They can't even influence the petrol prices <laughs> in a sustained way. So there's a lot of structural issues in the way government operates or doesn't operate in relation to vested interests. I think changing campaign funding is, is an important way to do it, uh, that you can reduce the direct financial influence, but you've still got to reform lobbying and you've still got to have other, other mechanisms like a National Integrity Commission or National ICAC to actually oversee the process. But... Um, you know, there, although all sides of politics seem to acknowledge these weaknesses, none of them actually stand up and do it in the end. Um, and that's always been a weakness in our system. We consolidate vested interest and uh, money-based politics in a way that is really counterproductive to the national interest. Uh, Shane, what uh, if it doesn't happen in the ACT, does it, Jane? Of course not, John. Of course not. We don't have any. Uh, we don't have any mining in the ACT. It does make it easier. But no, I actually completely agree with John. I think it does start back at those basic democracy issues around changing political donations and the like. Because if you take the money away, you take the influence away. And we're seeing it at the moment with um, just this week. There's meant to be changes to the national electricity rules. They're being whittled away. You know, none of them, each of themselves are fundamental, but each one is important. And uh, we've got all of the energy companies out there madly lobbying to defer those changes on the basis of the COVID impact. Now, you know, there is no doubt that COVID's placing a stressor on the system, but the influence has been very strong and very quick. Same that Anna Greta spoke earlier about some of the environmental laws that are being wound back. These things are happening very quickly. Uh, and I think it reflects the fact that those lobbyists and influencers get through the door very quickly. Oh, true. Um, we, have, uh, we have a question from Maynul Haq. We need uh, a climate change-led economic re recovery. I think this, is, this, is, this has been answered in some way. What is the panel's view on this and what can be done to influence government policies in this regard? I think, I think that has uh, largely been answered. Uh, I would um, Go down. Um, I was just going to put in a little bit of a pitch for imagination, which is the other thing I think we need to be aware of at the moment. Um, you know, I would. I, I've. I was struggling personally with with having to give up flying. I knew I had to, but I really struggled with the idea that it might ha actually happen. Um, and so, what has happened in the last three months is stuff that I couldn't imagine, um, and that I would have struggled to imagine. Right now, we can imagine how we work, we can imagine how we educate, we can imagine how we spend our time. Do we need a 38 hour working week? Do we need to drive to work every day? Do we need to work in the office environment? Do we need to invest in industries that we know will undermine our health and well-being today and into the future? Or can we make some economic choices as we regrow uh, ourselves that will move away from a consumptogenic model, move towards a more environmentally sustainable model? I, I think that right now, this year, is the most extraordinary opportunity for imagination to really put all cards on the table and, and to ask questions to policymakers, to, to ask questions within our own lives of how how we want to live. I think it's the most extraordinary moment. Thanks, Anna Greta. Um, uh, I'd go to another question. Uh, there's been a lot of work done at the state level in, in uh, Western Australia, South Australia, Tasmania, Victoria, and the ACT. Um, what is the relative importance of state action compared with federal action in reducing emissions? I feel obliged to start that one. Um, <laughs> and I think it's, um, the federal government plays a critical role. And as I touched on a comment before about the three steps, I think that if the federal government was to set the big picture and define the goal of where we need to get to, that would help. Mm -hmm. But the reality is the state governments and a lot of local councils around the country are doing a lot as well. It's not just been the state and territory governments. A lot of councils, even though they're quite small and their resources are doing terrific things. 
And I think it's the local governments and the state and territory governments, are a lot of where the rubber hits the road is there's a lot of very practical work to be done. I think that's why you've seen a lot of action at that level, but also the grassroots influence is stronger at that level because the politicians, the members of the various parliaments and the councils, I think are more connected to that than perhaps in federal politics where it gets a bit more removed. Uh, and so the opportunity and the fact that the state and territory governments and the councils are doing so much is that when you get a federal government that actually does want to act, there'll be a lot of momentum there to tap into. I think for me, that gives me a, a cause for optimism. And look, I'd say that the states are generally and local government are generally further in front than the national government in terms of climate and climate response. Uh, in terms of objectives that state governments have set, uh, policies that they started to put in place to transition to low carbon society or net zero emissions, whatever objectives they're using, to climate emergency, they've all layers of this. They haven't got it very well structured yet. But uh, I think the idea of a national cabinet based on, on, on uh, expertise, the Transition Commission giving that expertise, can be an effective framework. Being a bit controversial, I think I'd put the opposition on that as well. Uh, and, um, you know, make it a genuine attempt to uh, generate a level of bipartisanship, uh, state, federal, uh, labor, liberal, whatever, because uh, that's what it's going to take for us to move to the stage we need to in terms of setting up a framework that most people will just accept and move towards. And once you start to explain to people what is expected of them or what the opportunities are for them, you'll get a very different reaction. And as Anna Goethe said about uh, travel, I mean, the use of this sort of technology to hold an event like this, rather than flying people in and putting them up overnight and you know, the costs and inefficiency of that is uh, uh, significant. I know in a lot of companies around Sydney and Melbourne now, they're looking at whether they really do need to go to physical face-to-face -face meetings as regular as they do, and they can do many more of them using these sorts of platforms. And uh, I think you've got a structural shift in attitudes and in values and in practices as a result of COVID-19, which uh, you, know, you know are significant, they won't be easily reversed. Nor should they could be, but nor should they be. But they provide an opportunity to move forward in a in a collaborative way. We've done it with the virus. So we should be able to do it on climate and a number of other issues that are bedeviling this nation. Um, thanks, John. Just a quick 30-second response to this question, and I would now wrap it up because we're, we're reaching the end of the time. Um, it's a question for you. What would be the makeup of the so-called New Deal in Australian society, given the polarized politics on climate change? This is from Mansoor Sayed. That's to me? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's got all the... Uh, the way I like to think about it is sort of sector by sector what needs to be done. What do you need okay. to do in the transition to the power sector, the transport sector, the agricultural sector, buildings, uh, industrial processes? It's a framework. It's maybe not the most effective framework, but it's a way of thinking about setting a, setting a pathway, if you like, in each of those sectors and then okay. coming back to what each of the players in that sector, be it individuals, institutions or whatever, need to do to actually get there. So there's a question from Muhammad Ali, and then this is again a 20 second response because now we're, um, uh, will the number of jobs lost due to saying uh, goodbye to coal industry be equal to the new jobs created due to Green New Deal? Um, I mean, this is probably, it, it's, it can't be framed in this fashion. I mean, jobs lost. And I think what we know is new, um, um, the greener pathway generates much more jobs than the fossil fuel led path. I think the renewable energy and others have already shown that pathway. Um, so it is, it is, and there is statistics on that, and there is evidence on that. Um, it, it, is, it is not a uh, not a, a hypothetical situation. I think with with all this, we're we're coming to the end of our session. I think I'd like to thank the uh, excellent panelists, uh, John, Will, Anna Greta, and Shane, uh, for an excellent discussion on climate change and green new deal and what we all need to do uh, from the government, citizen, community, business, and at the scientific level as well in addressing uh, this uh, uh, crisis in an integrated manner. Thank you everyone and thank you attendees for joining us. And we hope that next time we will be able to, as a Forum Australia event, do it as a dinner event and have an, at a nice restaurant uh, when the conditions are safe to do so. The food was lacking this time. The food was lacking. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thanks so much. Uber Eats, actually. Thanks, Good night. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.